Back in 2013, I got the first iPad Air. And for many years after that, it served as my computer. And for 13 year old me, that mostly meant playing games, surfing the web, and watching YouTube. When I needed something more powerful, I got the 2017 MacBook Pro. And my first iPad Air became more of a supplemental device. But even the MacBook wasn't cutting it for me. I needed something with a bit more power. So when the 2020 iPad Air came my way, I challenged myself to see if it could be a proper replacement for my Mac. And here's what I learned. To put my iPad to the test, I gave it a simple question. Can I run this whole blog off my iPad? The short answer, yes. The long answer is way more complicated. But let's start with the short answer. Yes, I am able to create a new blog post from start to finish off my iPad. I will start by doing some research in Safari and get to typing in Grammarly. Then once everything is proofed and ready, I paste the script into Parrot, a teleprompter app, and get to recording. When finished, I can then plug my camera directly into my iPad thanks to the addition of USB-C and import the video clips into photos. From there, I can use LumaFusion to stitch the clips together and I end by posting the text to appleguideweb.com and uploading the videos to YouTube and Facebook. So moral of the story, I am able to run this whole channel off my iPad and I did so for a couple months. The capabilities of the iPad Air certainly impressed me and I ended up using my iPad more and more as I found ways to recreate more of my Mac workflows on my iPads. The keyword here is recreate. Unfortunately, due to the software limitations of iPadOS, you can't simply replicate your desktop workflow step by step. They're just fundamentally different devices. Instead, you have to learn the many quirks of the iPad in order to adapt and recreate your workflow. For instance, uploading a video to YouTube and Facebook was not as straightforward as it should have been. For some background, I export everything into the Files app where I find it much easier to organize everything into folders. But to upload the videos, I had to use a combination of apps and websites to get everything where it needed to be. For YouTube, I had to either save the video to my photo library or upload the video using YouTube's streaming app or go to Safari and upload it using their website. YouTube, why can't I upload videos using your studio app? Although I was able to upload the video to Facebook using their mobile creator studio app. But that's the problem with both YouTube's streaming and creator apps and Facebook's creator studio app. They are more or less iPhone apps scaled up for the larger screen, and they're a shell of their online counterparts. Then you ask, why not skip the apps and upload the videos using their respective websites? Well, that would be nice if YouTube Studio wasn't so buggy on the smaller screen and Facebook's Creator Studio supported Safari. Have you tried another browser, you may also ask? Well, what's the point if Apple requires every iOS browser to be a redesigned version of Safari? While I'm complaining about apps, here's another one. Adobe Lightroom, which requires you to purchase and use their creative cloud storage, ignoring the fact that you can buy an iPad with up to two terabytes of storage that you may or may not want to sync using their services. It's unfortunate since Lightroom is probably one of the only pro photo cataloging apps aside from Apple's built-in photos app. Now that we're on the topic of pro apps, Apple, where's Final Cut and Logic? Finally, I can't complain about apps without also complaining about the multitasking on iPadOS, which is messy. I plan on making a more detailed video on the state of multitasking on iPadOS, but here's the gist. You can have four apps on the screen at a time, two in split view and one hovering over one of the two and a video playing in picture in picture mode. How do you use all of these different modes? It would take me too long to explain. It's so confusing that Apple added three dots at the top of every window to remind you of your limited multitasking options. On top of that, some apps support opening multiple windows for you to lose. And instead of Apple doing something to fix all of this, they make it worse by adding more layers to it. 
For example, this year Apple announced Stage Manager and boasted about how you can now resize windows on iPadOS before ultimately revealing that under the hood is the same old tedious multitasking system as before. However, there is still time for Apple to tweak the feature before iPadOS 16 comes out in the fall. Although there are some things that the iPad got from the Mac and does pretty well. For starters, the iPad supports a keyboard and mouse. I have a full video coming that will go more in depth on how an iPad uniquely interfaces with a keyboard and mouse, but for now, its most prominent benefit is giving back some screen real estate that's typically taken by the on-screen keyboard. The mouse is just an added bonus so you don't have to keep reaching up to touch the screen. This is a great addition, especially for users who are heavy typers and it doesn't cost much to give it a try. You also have the merger of software between macOS and iPadOS thanks to Project Catalyst, which creates a more unified experience between the two platforms. Some examples of this are music and Safari. I also have to give props to Apple for the Files app. It's come a long ways and still has a ways to go, but it is nice that iPadOS now has a Finder-like file manager that can be accessed across the system. But at the end of the day, Apple and its users need to ask themselves, what they want the iPad to be. Do you want the iPad to be a screen that runs macOS? Or do you want it to be a tablet that functions like a larger iPhone? Because right now, it still feels like an oversized iPhone that's too scared to step into the territory of the Mac. Now, if you are in the market to purchase a new iPad, you need to ask yourself, what will I actually be using this for and is it worth the time and effort of reinventing the wheel to accommodate a touchscreen device? Then if you do end up getting an iPad, we just turn it into a MacBook as I did thanks to Apple's Magic Keyboard. And if so, you have to consider the price comparison. You get the 2020 iPad Air for $750 and add a Magic Keyboard for an additional $300. That's a total of $1,050. Is that worth it when you can get a comparable MacBook Air for the same specs for $9.99? The iPad is going through an identity crisis. Does it want to be a Mac? Does it want to be an iPhone? And what does it mean to be an iPad? But at the end of the day, if Apple wants to keep marketing the iPad as a computer and ship high-end pro models with desktop class performance, they need the software that it runs on to meet the hardware halfway. And until then, no one is going to take the iPad serious. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe as I plan to go more in depth into some of the features we talked about today. Anyways, once again, thanks for watching. Check out the links in the description and I'll catch you in the next one.